The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals presents the timeless teaching of Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. I point out to you from the Word that when you have trusted in the redemption provided for you in Christ, God could no more send you to hell than he could send Jesus Christ to hell. When you hear these words in your ear or see them in print, is there an immediate swelling of joy in your heart? This is the witness of the Holy Spirit. There are times in my life when this witness becomes almost intolerable. So great is the joy it brings. So heavy is the weight of glory which he lays upon us. Over a half a century ago, the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, then pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, saw the need to spread God's word beyond the hearing of his local congregation. He started the radio outreach which has become known as Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible. The application of God's word as taught by Dr. Barnhouse is as relevant today as when he first taught over the radio airwaves decades ago. The message we'll be featuring on today's edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is entitled, The Responsive Heart. If one person claims to have witnessed a crime, it's possible you'd question his reliability. But if three people gave the same eyewitness account, you would accept their unified testimony as trustworthy. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and the blood of Jesus Christ all testify in unison to the hearts of believers bearing witness that we are the children of God. Does your heart respond in faith to the good news of salvation? The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, The Responsive Heart. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank Thee that we can come to Thee in this hour and know that Thou art tender toward us with a greater love for us than we have for Thee and with a greater desire to bless us than we have to receive a blessing. Wilt Thou look upon us, therefore, in Thy grace and speak to our hearts as Thou seest each need? We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are studying now in the 8th chapter of Romans, and the 16th verse, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit. Christianity is not a religion of the senses, though it affects every part of life and all of our emotions and our senses. We must be very careful that our religious senses do not deceive us and that we do not trust in any sort of feeling, for it is very possible for feeling to be deceived. I remember an incident that I heard about in my student days that will serve as a warning that our feelings may not be trusted. A young man coming from a western town got off an express train at Trenton, New Jersey. He wanted to go to Princeton, and he had been told that at that hour of the day, his best connection would be to walk a block or two from the railroad station and take the streetcar, which in those days still ran between Trenton and Princeton. It was his first time in a city of any size and he was proud enough to wish to get along without asking information. He walked the distance to the street where the car tracks were to be found, and soon he saw a car marked Princeton. Without any hesitation, he got on the car and paid his fare. After 15 or 20 minutes, the conductor came through the car and collected another fare for the next zone of travel. The young man paid this fare and again at the next zone change. Finally, he could tell that they were nearing the end of the line. The conductor began turning the seats back to face the opposite direction. The young man picked up his valise and now asked his question, which way is the campus of Princeton University? The conductor looked at him, dumbfounded, and said, did, did you want to go to Princeton? Why, you should have taken this car going in the other direction. You are in Hamilton Square. 
Now, the important point in this story is that the young man felt like he was going to Princeton. He had traveled for 10 miles in quiet confidence that he was going where he thought he was going and found suddenly that he was miles away in another direction. Now, I'm quite sure that there are many men and women in this world who are on their way to the lake of fire without hope and without God, but who feel like they are going to heaven. At this point, someone may wish to remind me of my text and point out that I've just quoted the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Is not this a feeling? And can we not trust that feeling? Now we've established in our previous study that the witness of the Spirit is always based on the Word of God and is in tune with the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. For there are three that bear witness on earth, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the blood of the cross of Christ. And these three agree in one. It therefore follows that the witness of the Spirit is not a mere feeling in the sense of some spine-tingling emotion or vague sense movement. It is definitely an intelligent, controlled, and related work of God in our hearts. This fact rules out all religious experiences which make light of the Word of God or which seek to operate apart from the Word of God and its teachings. A few years ago in Los Angeles, city of so many false cults, there was a group who called themselves the Witnesses of the Spirit. They were always preaching that every Christian had to pass through certain experiences and that it was necessary to seek those experiences. We say immediately that it is always necessary to turn away from anything that wishes to present an experience rather than a deeper manifestation of the knowledge of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a member of this group who talked to a well-balanced biblical Christian, seeking to draw him to this same search after an experience. Have you had the witness of the Spirit, he inquired of the Christian? I have certainly experienced that which the Bible describes as the Holy Spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. Oh, no, insisted the other. It's something much more wonderful than that. He then went on to tell how he had gone to meeting after meeting and had tarried long hours waiting for this supposed experience. Then he said, one night after I had prayed almost all night, I had this marvelous experience. It was just as though a ball of fire came through the ceiling of my room and struck me in the breast and it burned and burned all the sin out of me. And thus I received the witness of the spirit. Then he added a question. Did you ever have an experience like that? And the biblical Christian correctly answered, No, thank God I never did. For if ever such an experience came to me, I would not be sure whether it came from God or the devil, but I would rather suspect the devil. Now, you have only to examine the words spoken by this cultist to see that his experience was a counterfeit. For he said that this supposedly supernatural fire burned the sin out of him the Holy Spirit's true witness would have taught him that sin is not removed by fire, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. I once recounted this incident in a meeting and gave the biblical teaching in connection with it, showing that the Spirit's witness must agree with the blood. At the close of the meeting, a man came to me with an objection. He assured me that the Bible taught the removal of sin by fire. He read to me the following verse from the prophecy of Isaiah. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and he said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. The sixth chapter of Isaiah, sixth and seventh verses. Now, if his interpretation is correct, then there is a definite contradiction in the Bible. For we read in the New Testament, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Now the answer to this supposed contradiction lies in the fact that the coal of fire was taken from the altar of sacrifice. We must not forget that when the kindling had been laid upon the altar and the body of the lamb placed upon the wood, divine fire came horizontally from the holy of holies of the tabernacle and lighted the fire and consumed the lamb. The fire that was upon the altar had 
burned the body of the lamb, and the blood had dripped upon those coals. The picture is one of divine justice consuming the substitutionary victim. It is a beautiful symbol of the fact that God the Father put the Lord Jesus Christ to death. It should be realized again that the most important thing that ever could be said about the death of the Savior is that God the Father put him to death. The fact that the Jews delivered him to death is relatively unimportant. The fact that Gentiles did the actual nailing is relatively unimportant. The important fact is that the scripture teaches us that it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. This was the fact that Peter proclaimed on the day of Pentecost. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up. The witness of the Holy Spirit, therefore, is that which draws us into the center of the experience of Jesus Christ, makes us conscious of our union with him in his eternal plan for us, climaxing in our union with him in his death and resurrection. This is that which sets the heart in such rejoicing with the God who did all of this, that we joyfully cry, Abba, Father. The soul that knows this truth is never going to be drawn aside to any seeking after some fancied second blessing or a spirit baptism or other exotic experience. Possessing the Lord Jesus Christ and being possessed by him, we have all that the Godhead can offer to us. It has begun with God the Father who planned and decreed the whole stupendous work of redemption and union, originating in his heart of love. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ was a very personal matter. His work in salvation for us being the giving of himself and the drawing of ourselves to him in a most personal relationship. Now the third person of the Godhead, the blessed Holy Spirit, completes all of this with a most personal testimony with our spirit that we are the children of God. And we must answer with this same personal yieldedness, which draws into the fullest assurance of the certainty and finality of our relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is this assurance that will make our day-by-day -day life one of the most great joy and the most complete triumph. In fact, this entering into the assurance of our relationship with the Godhead is so wonderful that its realization often seems like a new experience of salvation. But fortunately, it is something that can be continuously known in an ever greater measure as we come into fuller consciousness of what he is and what he has done for us. It is the common experience of lovers to be amazed that they have come to know each other. I almost have to pinch myself, says the young man, to make me realize that I have won your love and that you really love me. And the girl says, I almost have to pinch myself to make me realize that I really belong to you and you to me. And as they get to know each other better, the joy and wonder of true love grows and grows. Thus it is and more with the assurance that he gives us of our relationship with the whole of the Godhead. Several years ago, I was preaching for a few days in Portland, Oregon. A young minister came to me and invited me to drive with him and his wife the next day to view again the noble grandeur of the Columbia River Valley. I never like to go to the Northwest without seeing this, which I believe to be the most beautiful river valley in the world. The next morning, he came to my hotel, and I entered the car to take my seat beside his wife as we started on our trip. She remarked on the blessing of the service the evening before when I had preached on the joys of being joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. Her exact words were, Oh, doctor, that message last night was such a blessing to me. All the way home, my heart was just turning handsprings at the thought of all that we have in Christ. I replied, speaking rather slowly, turning handsprings, cartwheels, somersaults. Well, that is a very interesting way of uh, describing it. 
but uh, the Bible gives it in different terms. There we read, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Oh, you must ask yourself if you are at this moment conscious of that testimony. The distance between my lips and your ears is a measurable one, whether it be a few score feet in the auditoriums of a church building or the many miles across the airwaves by means of radio. And the process of putting words down on paper is a definable one. Through the various stages of manuscript, printing, galley proofs, page proofs, and the printed volume. But the distance from the ear to the center of heart and soul and mind, and the distance from the eyes to that center of heart and soul and mind, is immeasurable and indescribable. Only the Holy Spirit can bridge that last great distance from the hearing and the seeing of the physical senses to the comprehension and realization of joy and peace and prayerfulness that comes with our sonship through Jesus Christ, witnessed by the Holy Spirit. Ask yourself if there is the second voice in your heart witnessing to the truths which you hear preached from the pulpit or which you find in the printed page. Above and beyond the light waves of sound and sight, is there the witness of the Holy Spirit to the very center of your being? I tell you, for example, that God himself has nothing against you anymore forever, because Jesus Christ has satisfied every demand of the justice and the righteousness of that divine being who put his son to death. Does a second voice within your heart bear witness that this is blessedly true for you? Imagine an empty house, silent in the middle of the night. Then suddenly a recording of the Hallelujah Chorus is played with a loudspeaker turned on to full volume. This even cannot compare with the beginning of the knowledge of the present possession of eternal life and the assurance that we are the children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Rutherford describes this witness as follows. It is the testimony of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bearing witness to the Lord Jesus Christ and revealing the complete redemption, justification, and sanctification of every believer by him and in him, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. When the Roman soldier pierced the side of the crucified Savior, the beloved disciple John tells us that forthwith came there out blood and water, and the fountain was opened for sin and uncleanness. The blood, the atonement offered for thousands, the water, the cleansing and sanctifying efficacy of the truth by the Holy Spirit for our daily life. We have often read this and heard this preached, and we profess that it is written in God's word, and yet, after all, in but small degree practically, and to a few comparatively is the joy of their adoption known. And therefore did the apostle pray God concerning those to whom he wrote the precious gospel of the grace of God, that the eyes of their understanding being enlightened, that they might know what is the hope of their calling, so that with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, they might be changed into the same image from glory unto glory, as by the Spirit of our Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is the agent by which the mind is cleared, the veil removed, the understanding illuminated, the apprehension spiritualized, and we are enabled to see the nature of the fellowship and communion, which as believers we enjoy, and which I hath not seen nor ear heard, nor has it ever entered into the heart of man to consider, but which the Spirit of the Lord reveals to us in his word and by his word. We must not think that the witness of the Spirit is something difficult or distant. It is, on the contrary, something that is divine and therefore very simple and imminent. I very often rejoice in God in the way I saw this truth exhibited in the heart and tongue of a small boy. 
One Sunday I was preaching in my church in Philadelphia. I had chosen for my subject a rehearsal of the verses in the scripture in which God treats his work concerning our sin. I had before me a dozen texts and spent two or three minutes on each one of them, presenting the various facets of the whole gem of truth. First, we saw that our sins are forgiven. God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven our sins. Then he tells us that our sins are forgotten. What a wonderful thing is the memory of God. He forgets our sins, but he tells us that he is not unrighteous to forget our work of faith and our labor of love. Further, we have been cleansed of our sins. And whether you wish to consider this cleansing as an erasing or a washing, you will find the promises there if you look for them. He does not stop with this. For we learn that if we have been such objects of his grace, that we have been pardoned from all of our sins. Even when we look back upon our sins with regret and repentance, we find that the Father has dealt with them already, and that he does not see them anymore because Christ has satisfied every demand against us, and we are fully pardoned. Our sins are also said to be atoned for. The price has been paid. The Lord Jesus became the propitiation for our sins. We are redeemed. This means that the justice of God is forever satisfied and that he could never have anything against the one who has trusted in the Savior. Our sins have been remitted, which means that they have been put off or put away. Now, if a man covers his own sins, he shall not prosper, but the Lord himself has dealt with them forever and they can never be uncovered. Our sins have been cast into the depths of the sea. They have been blotted out as a thick cloud. They have been removed as far as the east is from the west. He will remember them against us no more forever. He has cast all my sins behind his back. And since all things are open unto him and he sees all things, this is a great figure of speech to tell us that he has put our sins in a place that does not exist. Now, as I preached this great message of deliverance that Sunday morning, I noted a boy who may have been about 12 years old. He was sitting in the gallery and had leaned forward, holding the rail, and was listening with great intentness. When I came to my summing up, I put all of the promises into a single sentence. Our sins are forgiven, forgotten, cleansed, pardoned, atoned for, remitted, covered. They have been cast into the depths of the sea, blotted out as a thick cloud, removed as far as the east is from the west, remembered against us no more forever, cast behind God's back. And then we sang... How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? I went to the back of the church to greet the people as they were leaving the building. In a few moments, the people from the galleries began to come down, and the boy came toward me. Just as I was turning away from greeting one group of people, the boy caught my sleeve and said, Good sermon, Doc. I smiled, and he continued, Gee, we're sure sitting pretty, aren't we? And then he went on his way. I looked after him for a moment, and there came a great joy in my heart, because I knew that there had been in his heart the witness of the Holy Spirit. It makes no difference in what language you say it, it is the same truth. My heart was turning handsprings, said the minister's wife. We're sure sitting pretty, said the schoolboy. His spirit beareth witness with our spirit, says St. Paul. And if you really belong to the Lord and have come to the place where you have trusted in him alone, that divine voice is within you right now, giving the warm glow of divinely revealed truth. Within your heart, there will be the melody. With the minister's wife, the melody was in 4-4 time. With the boy, it was singing with an accent on the downbeat. With St. Paul, it was in the stately cadence which Bach would later use for his chorales. Whatever the tempo of the song, it is a divine song. And there can be no heart that is truly renewed that does not become Symphony Hall forever. And our God and Father, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit will take thy word to us and use it to thy glory, that there may be many men and women who listen, who shall come to the place where they know and understand that the Lord Jesus has taken their place, given them life eternal. And to thee be the praise, the honor, and the glory now, till our Lord Jesus come again and forever.
Amen. When you rest in the finished redemptive work of Jesus Christ and trust in the sure promises of the Bible, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a true child of God. We hope you have benefited from today's message by Dr. Barnhouse entitled, The Responsive Heart. You can listen to additional Bible teaching by the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse via the Internet. Visit us online at AllianceNet.org. An audio copy of today's teaching is available by calling us toll-free, 1-800-488-1888. Today's message again is entitled, The Responsive Heart, or simply ask for message number R8-31. We would also like to make available to you a free copy of our booklet entitled, Men Whom God Struck Dead. Some states and nations forbid any form of capital punishment. But the Bible records several instances of divine capital punishment where God Himself struck men dead. This free booklet examines these accounts and reminds us that no aspects of our spiritual lives can arise from a fleshly or human origin. Our worship service and surrender must conform to God's ways and find their source in the Holy Spirit. Ask for your free copy of Men Whom God Struck Dead when you call or write. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is a radio ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We exist to promote a biblical understanding and worldview, drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformation theologians from decades and even centuries gone by. We seek to provide contemporary Christian teaching materials which will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible comes to you through the generous gifts of our listeners. If you have benefited from the broadcast and would like it to continue, please prayerfully consider a donation to help us keep this ministry on the air. For more information or to make a contribution to support and further our work, please contact us by writing Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, Box 2000, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103, or call toll-free. 1-800-488-1888. Visit us online at AllianceNet.org. Be sure to ask for a free updated resource catalog featuring books, audio teachings, commentaries, booklets, daily devotionals, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians, including Donald Gray Barnhouse, James Montgomery Boyce, and Martin Lloyd-Jones. Then join us again next time for more classic teaching on... Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible.